uh, I'm going to be presenting lots of different work from lots of different people. And um, a bunch of it is uh, created by my team uh, on the other side of the bridge. Um, I work with about 60 scientists from a bunch of uh, different places in many different countries. And um, so uh, a lot of the work that I'll be sharing that's from Vicarious itself is, is, is theirs. Um, and we're, we're lucky to be funded by some of my personal heroes. We've raised um, a little over $120 million from people like Bezos and Zuckerberg and Elon and so on. Um, and we're actually advised by one of, uh, one of Stanford's own, Fei Fei. Um, Lee is, is one of our advisors. Um, so um, we have a, 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 an agenda today to talk about a couple different things. Um, one is about the strengths and limitations of modern AI systems. And I'll, I'll try and frame it in a way that's acceptable to people who know a lot about it and also understandable to people who know a little bit about it. So I'm going to try and walk a very fine line. Um, and then I'll run through some of the different economic, social, and policy implications um, that I expect this to have in the near term and, and then in the distant future. And then finally, uh, I'd like to give at least my set of predictions from where I sit in the industry about what I expect to be coming uh, on the horizon. Um, so I think there's this really interesting relationship um, or lens we can have on the development of artificial intelligence that kind of maps it to the evolution of animal intelligence. So if we go back 600 million years, um, we get to the very first uh, intelligent animals, things like jellyfish, flatworms, sea sponges. Uh, and then as time passes, the animals get more complicated. Uh, I would argue they don't get any smarter. It's just deeper layers of very simple heuristics, very narrow um, kinds of behaviors. In the neuroscience world, this is called the old brain. Um, and it's built on stimulus and response. It's built on instinct. And then about 100 million years ago, or 100 million years later, oh yeah, 100 million years ago, we got a completely different architecture for intelligence um, that evolution figured out called the neocortex, the new brain. Uh, it's what gave us primates, whales, dolphins, and you and me. Um, and instead of being built on top of stimulus and response uh, and instinct, it's built on top of reasoning about causality, reasoning about what if and why, uh, and mental simulation, imagination. Those are the sort of the hallmarks of mammals versus our older brain ancestors. Um, and the argument I'll make today is that deep learning and you know, largely the current generation of AI systems that we see the prolifer proliferation of are in the big yellow box here. They're, they're largely based on uh, instinctual stimulus response kinds of behaviors. Um, and uh, I'll give you some examples from the animal kingdom and also from the computer kingdom uh, so we can compare and contrast. So um, from, and it's not to say that there's anything wrong with the old brain. Like old brain animals are really cool. They can do all kinds of stuff. They can navigate complicated environments, they can control their limbs, you know, they can reproduce. Uh, the old brain is really, really cool, uh, but it has some really important limitations to keep in mind when we think about how it maps to uh, AI systems. So um, specifically, to make an old brain animal, you need a couple of hundred million years worth of evolutionary training data. Uh, and when you finish your evolving process for that animal, you're going to get um, a system that has very low generalization in new environments that has very low ability to learn new skills uh, or adapt. Uh, and most importantly, what will be produced is an animal that gives the illusion of intelligence without actually being smart. So like, it will give you um, a perception that the animal is doing a behavior that is what a human might do in the same circumstance without actually having any of the reasoning that backs it up. And I'll give you some examples of that. Um, so in a nutshell, when you look at the old brain's architecture, you have a, you know, a sound or a video or a picture signal that comes into the system. Uh, there's a bunch of very narrow heuristics that are stored in the animal's brain, and then it, and then it takes some action, performs some response. Um, and so here's some, some sort of fun examples. Um, baby geese uh, make this noise. Let's see if you can hear it. Um, and scientists figured out that mother geese will actually love and care for anything that makes that sound. So you can take a tape recorder that plays that noise and put it inside of a taxidermy of a wolf, and the mother goose will love and care for the wolf as if it's one of its own children. Um, and similarly, uh, baby ducks exhibit this really cool behavior where they follow their mom uh, in a very orderly fashion. And um, so, you know, if you, what they're actually doing is not following their mom, they're following the first thing they saw when they were born. So if the, the, these baby ducks are born and they see a dog, they will follow the dog everywhere as if it's their mom. So it's like a very specific, very narrow heuristic the system's using in order to produce intelligent looking behavior. Uh, and the same thing is true of frogs. A frog will actually starve itself to death in front of an iPhone uh, because it's just performing the action. If you see this pixel pattern, you shoot the tongue. Um, and these are the same kinds of behaviors you'll see in old brain AI systems. You know, deep learning is great. It can do lots of really cool looking things. Like it can play Atari games or Go games. 
Um, it can even recognize photos and, and control robots, but it has the same limitations as the old brain does. So it takes a lot of training data to make a deep learning system work. Um, the resulting model is not going to generalize well to new environments or circumstances, and it's not going to understand cause and effect or understand what it's doing and why. Uh, it's just going to give you the illusion of intelligence. And it even has the same architecture as our, our old brain friends. Um, so uh, I want to give you guys a tutorial about why this is. Um, and just to take a quick temperature, so who here feels like they could give a concise explanation of how AlphaGo works? How many people? OK, like maybe 10% of you, maybe less. So OK. So I'm going to give you a tutorial about how, at the end of this, you'll be able to tell your friends how AlphaGo works. Um, in a way that uh, is, I think, pretty true. It's not exactly how AlphaGo works, because that would be a much longer talk. Uh, but it's close enough that it may as well be. So um, let's say we're going to build an AI system for reading handwritten digits like these. Um, step one in building a system like this is to collect thousands or millions of hand-labeled, human-labeled training examples. So this is 6,000 examples of the number 0. This is 6,000 examples of the number 1, of the number 2, and so on. You gather 60,000 labeled training examples. Uh, and you feed them to the system, and you, when then when you show it a new image like this, uh, basically what it's doing is it compares this to every image it's seen in its training data set. So you, you know, flip through all the ones, the twos, the threes, and so on, and eventually it gets here, and it's like, wait a minute, these are really close matches, so you know, voila, it's a four. Um, and if you want to take that system and scale it from recognizing digits to recognizing photos, um, you again collect a very large corpus of hand-labeled images, like, for example, we labeled this image corn because somewhere in the image there's corn. And then instead of 60,000 training examples, you'd show it over a million. This is the ImageNet training set, courtesy of Stanford. Um, and then at the end of that process, you could show it a new image, and it would say, this matches what I know about cars. Um, but if you show it a picture like this one, it'll say it's a bedroom pillow uh, instead. Because it doesn't really learn anything about cars. It's just doing very dumb pattern matching. Um, and similarly, you know, it may recognize this as a Jaguar, but a hand drawing of the exact same image, it's going to have no idea what that is. Uh, and it will also recognize images like this as Jaguars, because um, it's just doing sort of basic pattern matching. Um, and similarly, it's important to realize it's not actually learning anything about objects. It like, doesn't know that there's a such thing as an object. It's just matching patterns. And it's matching the patterns it sees in photos all mixed together. So like, if I keep the bus, the train, and the cat the same in these pictures, and I just change the background, a deep learning system will say that it's a, an amphibian, a uh, snowplow, and a chihuahua. So it's, it's a very, very um, simple and kind of narrow way of recognizing things. But it happens to work if you have a really big data set and a lot of compute. Um, and it's susceptible to uh, the kinds of attacks maybe some of you have seen before, where um, because it's doing a very narrow form of pattern matching, you can take an image that it will recognize. Yes? So for instance, if you took uh, a grayscale image of that same picture up there as an example, yeah. or any of these, yeah. versus the color, uh, which, which cues are you looking at? Are you looking at things that are geometric, or are you looking at color maps? Or That's, so that's the funny thing about deep learning is that you, it's hard to tell. Uh, you get a big monolithic black box out of it, and um, there's some dark magic you can do to kind of try and figure out how it's coming to the conclusions it's coming to. but. Um, the, the real answer is you really have no idea what the weights inside the network mean. Uh, and it happens to work some of the time. It happens to fail other percents of the time. You have a question? So it's just like you know, the multi-level neural networks. So there are certainly other ways of doing you know, pattern recognition and, and machine learning, you know, like decision trees or probably models. Right. And we'll get to there. Yeah. yeah. Which didn't ask, decision trees at least tell you, oh, is it yellow or is it green or whatever? Yeah. So that's, I think that's getting closer to the second half of the, of the talk about where I think things are going. Because right now, when you, when you read about AI, you're generally speaking reading about deep learning. Uh, and you know, every, every conference submission, deep learning is, is basically, if that's not in the title somewhere or in the abstract somewhere, then you pay a penalty in terms of the likelihood of your paper being accepted. Um, so um, it's also susceptible to these attacks where you, know, you, you can take an image that it will recognize as a bus with high confidence. You can perturb it very slightly, and, and that's just enough to cause it to misrecognize it as a completely different class. Uh, and you can do this with, with any photo. There's lots of different ways of generating these adversarial cases uh, that fool deep learning uh, and do not fool humans. Um, just to you know, dr drill home the point that these systems are not doing human-like reasoning about anything. They're just doing a very narrow sense of pattern recognition. Uh, and at the same time, you can also generate completely nonsense images that it will recognize with very high confidence as um, all kinds of different things. I actually have a, a deep learning app on my phone. Um, 
that I can take some pictures of these. In your head right now, um, see if you can classify the photos um, that are in front of you. <laughs> exactly. I, I think that's a that's a, a side effect of the generator, um, rather than of the technology itself. So let's see what this one has to say. CD razor wire. Ninety nine percent sure. Any guesses which one I just took a picture of? Starfish. Ninety eight percent sure. So all of them have similar kinds of reactions. So you can generate. A nonsense patterns that fit into the manifold that the deep learning system has been trained to recognize um, without actually being those objects. So this is, not, this is not a deep learning is bad talk. This is just what are the characteristics of deep learning, and this is one of them. Um, so to make a deep learning system work, you need lots of training data, uh, and the resulting system is not guaranteed to generalize particularly well to new environments, and it doesn't understand what it's doing. It doesn't have a, a causal model of itself or of the world um, that it can be used to reason. And um, so when you and I watch, this is a Google DeepMind's famous Atari player that's using deep reinforcement learning. When we watch the system, we say, okay, the pat it's using the paddle to hit the ball, to, get the to hit the bricks, to get points, um, which is not at all what's happening inside the AI system. What's actually happening inside the system is they just take three frames or four frames of the game and they paste them together into one image. So that they, they make a whole bunch of copies of this. And to give you a sense of the amount of data here, this is our 60,000 digits. This is the million photos, and this is the 50 million Atari frames this is trained on. So they paste you know, these three frames or four frames together, and then they do that 50 million times. And then uh, after playing the game at random to start with and playing it more and more, you eventually be begin to notice, oh, I went left and I lost points. So I'm going to classify that image or that series of images as a go right series of images, and then vice versa. And then over time, you're able to, to do pattern recognition where when you see a series of frames, you classify it as whether you should go left or go right. And you can tell that that's what the system's doing because small changes break um, this algorithm in the same ways that um, changes break the other you know, um, deep learning systems we looked at. So if you wanna, for example, change the rules of the game slightly where, where the ball bounces higher or the paddle's bigger or it's in a different position, um, all of these things you'll need to retrain your, your deep learning system from scratch with another 50 million frames of the game. And you can see it really very clearly. So I took that trained model and just increased the brightness of the game by 2%. So increasing the brightness of the game by 2% is enough to cause it to do this uh, instead of playing the game. Um, and with AlphaGo, it's, it's almost the same story. You take uh, you know, an input Go board, and down here now is our 60,000 digits. This is our million photos. That's the 50 million Atari frames. And this is the billion Go boards that's required to train AlphaGo to play Go. And uh, to put that in perspective, that's about 3,000 years of a human playing Go for 24 hours a day, seven days a week without sleep. Um, and so it's a, it's a lot of training data. And then after those billion Go boards are played, uh, it gets a, it, it, and it tallies up the scores every time. It gets a sense of what are the boards that look like losing boards, what are the ones that look like winning boards. And so anytime it's seeing a, a, you know, a new Go board like this one, um, it can then search over all possible descendant states of the board and pick the ones that uh, are the winningest. And voila, you have AlphaGo. So um, if you want it to play a different game like chess instead of Go, it's another 3,000 years uh, of training, um, changing the rules slightly. All the things that humans adapt to really well are things that the system is not going to do. Um, uh, you can also apply these same kind of architectures to controlling robots. This is Google X's recent uh, achievement called the Arm Farm. Um, they wanted to have a, a robotic system that could grasp objects. And to get these systems to grasp objects uh, that are all roughly the same size, uh, it took running it continuous, running 14 of these arms continuously for months, um, performing 800,000 practice graphs and collecting 2.8 million images. Um, and so after all of that, you, you basically store images like this pair, and then you record, did I grasp something or not? And then you can create a gradient where you're like, okay, these are pictures where I'm unlikely to grasp. These are pictures where I'm more likely to grasp, and do the same kind of regression operation that we've done in all the previous examples. Um, and note, like, so the system, after all this training, it fails 20% of the time. And when it does succeed, you can't tell it what to grasp. Like, it's just going to try and grab something. And sometimes it'll grab two things. Uh, and when it succeeds at grasping something, it succeeds in a way I wouldn't characterize as success. Like, it, it doesn't have a good plan about how to grab this object. It happens to work in this particular case. Uh, but if you change the gripper or even the color of the bin, uh, I'm not convinced it would still work, especially if you change the color of the bin. I think the color of the bin would cause it to have a catastrophic failure. Um, so 
So what can deep learning do? What is it good at? It's, it's, it's great at, if you have a lot of data and you have a lot of computers, um, you can make really accurate narrow predictions. Um, and it's, it's basically doing fancy regression. Um, and you know, if I'm the CEO of, of Google or Facebook or something, um, that's a really great thing. In fact, that may be the best thing ever because what I have are a lot of computers and a lot of data and what I want are really narrow predictions about what ad to show someone, what person's face might be in a photo, uh, and so deep learning is terrific, and that's why they invest so much money in it. Um, and it has some interesting implications. So just this kind of, you know, as narrow as it is, this kind of pattern matching um, actually, I think, is, is pretty powerful and transformative. So um, I'm not a policy wonk. I'm not an economist. Um, and so I wanted to disclaim all the things I'm about to say as someone who's not that much more informed about this than you are. Um, but I'll share with you the stuff I've, and this is also you know, aggregating from many other sources um, that I've read about this topic. Uh, and so for further reading, I'll offer some recommendations. But um, I think there's three main classes that I, I consider anyway when I think about implications of this kind of narrow AI, um, economic, social, and policy. Economic implications, um, so my favorite lens on what these kinds of narrow AI systems are, is, is going to do is, is as a decrease in the price of prediction. Because if you view these systems as just lowering the price of prediction, then you can use all of the standard economic tools to reason about what kind of effects it's going to have in the economy. So um, you can say, well, it's the de you know, decrease in the price of rubber, you're going to see use going up, and you're going to see the value of the complements going up uh, because more people are using it, so more people need the complements. Uh, and this is, there's a, a book that just came out recently called Prediction Machines that I would recommend to anyone who wants to go deeper into what are the economic implications of you know, standard modern AI um, deep learning. So, uh, and then it, when you say use increases, like you can use these kinds of systems everywhere to predict whether something is spam or not, you know, predict uh, what I'm saying when I talk to Siri, predict um, who I'm likely to vote for, predict what you might want to show me if you want to change who I'm likely to vote for. Um, so as you get down this list, it sort of gets darker and a little bit more interesting. Um, the other implication is uh, on the value of complements. So the two complements to systems like this are data and compute. Uh, and so companies that make computers that are very useful for these kinds of operations, like NVIDIA, uh, are going to see a dramatic increase in the demand for their products. Companies that have a lot of data that can be utilized in these ways, like Facebook, or Google are also going to see dramatic increases in the value they're able to capture from that data. Um, uh, next set of implications around society. So um, it might sound, and it sounded to me anyway, like a really good thing that um, we could have systems that would show me more articles that I wanted to see and less articles that I didn't want to see. Like, I don't want to read articles that are boring, so show me articles that are interesting. And as it turns out, um, this is actually kind of disastrously bad for society because uh, if everyone only sees articles that they like to read, and as it turns out, people like to read articles that they agree with and that, in fact, capitalize on their like worst human instincts and prejudices, um, then what we get are a bunch of people who all believe their view of the world is right and all have the most polarized version of their view of the world. Um, and so there's this experiment that Wall Street Journal did called Red Feed, Blue Feed that I would recommend all of you check out. Uh, and it just takes the most... Uh, biased articles from both sides of the spectrum and puts them right next to each other uh, on the same topic. And you get to see what each side, which facts each side chooses to emphasize or invent, um, and um, how, you know, when you're in one of these filter bubbles, you don't know it. No one's telling you that there are other views out there. And so a lot of the population of the world who's on these systems just thinks that their perspective on the truth is the truth. And so you end up with a society that's much more divisive than it had been when we just had the nightly news and we all watched the same four channels or something um, to, to singulate on what would be the truth. Um, and then the other implications for this is once you have these filter bubbles, then you can identify what kind of information would be necessary to cause the bubble to shift one way or the other, and that's the kind of stuff we saw in the election. Um, and other countries, other entities, like what we're seeing with Russia, can then choose to influence what's going on in people's minds by making targeted um, ad buys or targeted information campaigns at these bubbles. Um, next set of implications I think about when I think about the narrow AI that's here is about research um, and policy. Right now, uh, we're being like catastrophically outspent by China on fundamental research on AI, robotics, other fields. Uh, and um, uh, I can tell you what China's strategy is for, uh, for 
AI, robotics, and being the leader in all of these things. And I don't feel like I can give you a coherent explanation of what the United States' strategy is, which is something that makes me uncomfortable. I really feel like our government should be thinking very critically about how we should be taking advantage of the new technologies that were born here uh, and helping them to, to reach the next level uh, more quickly. Um, and the other thing is, um, and this goes into the uh, section I'll get into about jobs, um, America's infrastructure is really falling apart right now and uh, has been for a while. And to repair it, it's not something that narrow AI systems like this can do. And so as it turns out, you need a lot of people with hands and good skills in carpentry and, uh, and like stonework and concrete in order to repair these things. And uh, we've kind of lost uh, some of our ability to do these things. Um, last piece of policy uh, is on immigration. Um, so all six of the people, you probably recognize almost all six of these people. So it's, it's uh, uh, SpaceX, Google, Amazon, Yahoo, uh, eBay, and Apple. All of these people were either immigrants themselves or the children of immigrants. Uh, and so I think one of the things that has made America uh, what it is, is uh, our attitude towards welcoming brilliant people from elsewhere uh, and, and integrating them. And um, by adopting a different stance than that, I, I think that we're killing the golden goose, yeah. So since you're going to leave policy, before you leave policy, yeah. your previous point is really saying that we that the U.S. needs an industrial policy. And it has been the position of the United States government since the end of the Second World War that having a um, industrial policy is something that we'll never do. Yeah. So I, I, I'm not advocating for industrial policy specifically. And you sound very, very informed, much more informed than I am about this. Exactly. What are you uh, proposing? So do you think of the NIS as industrial policy or as basic science research? Because I'm advocating for more of that. Well, you just go back and listen to your words about okay. what you said we need to do. Yeah, it, funding uh, for fundamental research in AI yeah. and robotics. But your words pre previously were a little bit different. Than that. Okay, well, I retract my previous words and replace them with, I want funding in fundamental research in AI and robotics. Um, yeah. We had an interesting speaker yesterday, or not, not yesterday, uh, a couple weeks ago, yeah. who pointed out that when the, and I'll pick on the University of Southern California, when the <laughs> chancellor of the University of Southern California said the United States government should spend more money to help us compete with China and AI, yeah. he neglected to say that all of the money that is spent at USC yeah. is effectively spent educating Chinese nationals to take their AI back to China. Mm -hmm. So it, spending money at USC yeah. did not actually accomplish the goal. It did actually help him with his goal, which is fundraising for USC, right. you know, for whatever good that is. Yeah. So it's you know, a little weird to say, we're going to do this to, to compete with somebody when you're actually going to give everything you make to them. Yeah, I mean, I think you're talking about a specific instantiation of how the grants are dispersed and like to whom receive them, yeah. and I think there can be a little bit more granularity yeah, on that to go thing. All, all these, the devil's in the details, yeah. yeah. That's where all these things go to. Yeah. If I put an entirely different picture yeah. set of pictures up there, uh, the, the the answers change remarkably. Uh, on immigration. On or, oh yeah, exactly. Or, it's or yeah. Anything you do, yeah. To just say. Oh, we need this. We have a long history of, you know, yeah. spending a trillion dollars, and the result was five signs saying this project funded by. Yeah, exactly. And I, so I think this is there's no substitute for like thoughtful allocations of capital and for carefully designed programs and for all the things that are acquired. But we can't use the money we don't spend to make advances. Right, but we, what we can't say. We can't say, if this money was spent correctly, yeah. we'd have great benefits, therefore we must spend this money. I, I agree with it, yeah. yeah. That the answer is, we're not going to spend the money correctly. So yeah. no then we need to go backwards and actually fix the mechanisms by which yeah. grants are distributed and like all these things. Yeah. There's lots of bugs in the system to yeah. fix. Well, this topic is about the top of the funnel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you know, the middle and the bottom of the funnel, you know, there's a whole other talk about that. The, you know, until yeah. you fix the funnel, until yeah. you fix the bottom of the funnel, there's no point in putting anything at the top. Maybe. I mean, I, I, no point, I think, is, a, is a, a harder line stance that I think could possibly be justified because even if 80% of the money is lost by, like, it's just sent directly overseas or something, and 20% of it fund projects like ARPANET, then we end up with something that could be revolutionary. So I don't, I don't know that you can flush all of it. That's true, yeah. 
Well, there's a lot of money allocated to AI research in various forms by different agencies. Mm -hmm. So, would you advocate juicing up, figuring out which agency to juice up in one way or another, and juicing up an agency, or would you say we need an overall overarching strategy which has a budget? I'm going to strategy. I mean, I'm going to refer back to my my disclaimer slide and say what I'd advocate for is that someone who's very smart and has spent a lot of time studying these kinds of policies and programs uh, be put in charge of getting us a good one uh, and measuring how successful it is or is not and making adjustments to it so that it is successful. So you want an AI czar? I think that would be an interesting step. A good AI czar. I love the disclaimers for that. It has to be good, yeah. We mentioned before, about 30 years ago, Ed Feigenbaum, who used to be on the faculty here, testified before Congress that the U.S. would become an agrarian nation if, if Congress didn't fund a giant national AI lab headed by him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not asking for any of the money. I mean, I, I think this is this is also a, the kind of thing where I think it, there's a, a false narrative in the press about how it's like us versus China on this. Where like I think the discoveries that are made on the path towards creating better AI are discoveries that are going to be broadly beneficial and not selectively beneficial. Um, yeah. Well, and I don't want to hitch my wagon to anyone who's advocated it, for it, it you know one plan or another. Spots. Yeah. So the next problem is um, you want funding for AI. Somebody else wants funding for improved RF technology. Somebody else it's wants guns funding and butter, yeah. for you know, uh, something else. Yeah. So you have all of these these things that you can. That's where you end up having to have an industrial policy. Yeah. You have, to, you, you have to say, well, what is it that we want to achieve? And then you have to back back into it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's, let's yeah, we will, we, that, would, that would be a part of the process that would need to occur. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So, and, 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 and uh, it sounds like lots of people in here in this room have strong opinions about this, and uh, it'd be fun to have a follow-up conversation after the talk. Um, okay, so next part of this is kind of talking about where we go from here. Um, obviously, these deep learning systems are effective at a certain range of things. Um, but to get to the next level, as you mentioned at the beginning of this talk, um, I don't think we can rely exclusively on big data, pattern matching, um, old brain kinds of systems. Uh, and I think that we can draw some inspiration for what happened in evolution in order to figure out where exactly we look for the next generation of these systems. Um, and I'll give some examples from the animal kingdom. So um, uh, whales in captivity are trained to pick up uh, trash in their tanks and trade them with a the trainer for fish. And um, one day a seagull died and fell into the tank, and instead of getting one fish as a reward, the animal got two because it was like a big object or something. Uh, and you imagine a frog would just like eat both rewards and that would be that. The whale did not. The whale saved the second fish and then used it as bait to catch additional seagulls, which it then drowned and trained with the trainer for even more fish, created a stockpile of fish at the bottom of its tank, and then it used those fish to teach the other whales in the tank how to participate in the uh, seagull for fish economy. Um, next favorite example, um, so there's a gorilla in captivity um, uh, named Coco. That, this is not Coco, but I'm not allowed to use footage that I don't own the copyright to, so this is just a gorilla. Um, <laughs> so Coco uh, was raised in captivity. Her favorite thing to do was watch uh, a TV program called Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, which many of you probably saw. Uh, Mr. Rogers found um, that Coco was a fan of his show, so she went to visit him at the zoo. Uh, and if you recall Mr. Rogers' show, he always starts it by like welcoming the children to his house. He takes off his shoes and he teaches them the lesson of the day. Well, um, the first thing Coco wanted to do with Mr. Rogers when he met him, when she met him, was to help him take off his shoes because that's how he always started his show. Um, last example of these kind of new brain behaviors. Um, this is an 18-month-old human uh, being put in a new environment. It's never been in before, looking at objects it's never seen before, um, watching a human it's never met before do an action it's never seen a human do before, and it's given no instructions. So why is it that humans are able to do, and other mammals are able to do, these amazing feats of very low training data, very high generalization uh, reasoning? And the answer is um, you know, we have a radically different circuit in our heads than our, our reptile friends, our insect friends. 
Um, we still have the old brain. Uh, it's down there, controls our heart rate, our breathing, our immune system, all kinds of important things. But then on top of it, there's this completely different circuit called the neocortex. Um, if you cut it off the brain and you lay it flat, it's the size, shape, and thickness of a dinner napkin. Uh, and different parts of it correspond to different functions, like there's a part for hearing, a part for seeing, a part for language, a part for motor actions, a part for um, uh, spatial reasoning. Um, but it's all the same, roughly the same replicated circuit. So if you take a tissue sample from each of those regions and give them to a trained neuroscientist, they'll have a hard time telling which is from which region. And that's also even true across mammals. So if you give a, a neocortical sample from a, 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 a whale, a rhinoceros, a human, and a mouse, uh, all of those uh, neocortexes have remarkably similar wiring patterns. Uh, and they can even do these really cool experiments where they, they take a ferret uh, and they sever the optic nerve, and instead of allowing it to grow into the part of the neocortex that normally processes vision, they force it to grow into the part that normally processes hearing, and the ferret can see. So it's a, it's a replicated circuit that's performing the same kind of math mathematical operation, uh, and it actually has the inverse characteristics of deep learning. So mammalian brains take incredibly little training data uh, in order to learn new concepts, new ideas. They generalize really well to new environments and circumstances. And most importantly, they learn this causal model of the world that lets us ask what if and why, reason backwards from effects, their causes, and simulate forward in time. And that uh, is a, a really important thing to have if you're in a body and you want to solve problems with your body. Uh, because we don't get infinite training data to be in this particular room manipulating these particular objects. Chances are, you just get one chance at it. Uh, and so you need a system that's very, very fast at learning to be in new environments and reusing knowledge it already has. Uh, and that's the, those are the kinds of systems that we work out at Vicarious. Um, in contrast, the kind of deep learning architectures um, where you just have a stimulus, a black box, and a response, um, we work on systems that try and build causal relationships uh, in the world, build a causal understanding so that we can do uh, forwards and backwards reasoning. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of that. Um, and we focus on these kinds of causal models um, from a business perspective anyway because there's this really weird paradox that we all live in where um, the parts that go in robots, like motors and plastics and metal and electricity and processors, sensors, are all really cheap and nobody owns any. You know, if you go into a factory 100 years ago and a factory now, like basically nothing changes. It's like you get color. Color is what changes. Um, and we have people doing jobs that robots have been physically capable of doing you know, for over a decade. Uh, and the reason we have that um, is because we don't have uh, an intelligence layer that you can use to control the robot. So um, this is a, a video of basically Rosie the robot from the Jetsons. Um, and the trick of this video, it's a video from 11 years ago. The trick of this video is the robot's being controlled by a human. So as long as you have a human brain, you can do almost anything you want with a robot. If I just gave you a normal robot gripper and had you live your everyday life with it, I think you could do 90% of the things that you do every day. Um, and so functionally, we're already living in the Jetson society. We're just missing the advances in AI necessary to make robots useful and ubiquitous. Uh, and that's what we're, build we're building at Vicarious, and that's what a lot of our research leads into. It's sort of like Intel inside for robots. I'm going to skip through this part. Um, so uh, when we talk about how, you know, how do we approach the problem of, of, of working on AI, specifically working on AI for embodiment, um, there's a very famous computer science theorem um, called the no free lunch theorem, which basically they prove that every algorithm only gets power by making assumptions. So like MP3 was good at compressing songs because it assumes that you're a human and you're listening to music. And so it can throw away any data that's too high frequency or too low frequency that's in, inaudible for you to hear. Um, it can also assume that the left ear and the right ear are hearing roughly the same song, so you just store one of the two ears and then you know, the diff for the right ear. Um, so you make all these assumptions and it gets good at, at doing what it's designed to do, like compressing songs. And the strength of deep learning, the strength of you know, the AI that most people use today is that it doesn't make any assumptions. You can use the same architecture to recognize images, to play Go, to play Atari, to regulate you know, temperature sensors in a data center. You can do anything with it. Uh, and that's both its strength and its weakness. And so to get to systems that are more like our brains, more like a mammalian brain, you have to make stronger assumptions. And in our view, those assumptions come from physics. Um, so, and I think of them as sort of like properties of the universe. So like spatial regularity is a good one. When you look at my face, the pixels that make up my face aren't teleporting at random all over your visual field. They stay together. And when I move my head from side to side, my eyes, nose, and mouth move with my head. And when you move your head like this, 
the room transforms itself in the same way every time. And so there's all these statistical regularities or the fact that objects exist and objects tend to have attributes that persist over time, like this table is still wood. Um, and all of these things are things we can take advantage of when we look at how do we create um, uh, models that match the properties of the systems that we're looking to exploit. Um, and um, this is uh, the kind of work that we've been doing at Vicarious. The first thing that we did, um, and this is you know, five, six years ago now, uh, is we wanted to build a, a vision system modeled after mammalian neocortex uh, that had human-like uh, ability to generalize to shape recognition. Uh, and so the way we tested it um, was the same way humans test each other, is can you perceive like a human? We showed it captures. Um, and um, the problem with, with tech, reading text and reading captures specifically for like an old brain style AI system is that there's like a zillion different ways that even just one letter can vary. And so to get your old brain AI system to recognize all of them, you need to show it a gajillion examples. Um, whereas when you read all of these captures, you've probably never seen many of the styles of words that appear on the screen, but miraculously you're able to read them without any training. Uh, and that's the, the kinds of properties that we're looking to capture in our systems. Yeah? Algorithmic transformations are like warping and outlines and the things that you could, I mean, that's how these things are generated to begin with, like add noise, add yeah. outline, do, it, you know, do a uh, edge detection, you know, put some weird pattern on it, change the color, yeah. um, overlap them. So, I mean, in some sense, this is, I mean, maybe it's naive physics, it's, but a lot of these seem like this, you know, the 2D world, these are the sorts of rules that would govern, right? Yeah. I mean, GPUs and graphic systems already do that, right? Yeah, it's true. I mean, so I, a lot of the earlier work on how do you break captures tried to exploit that kind of idea. Um, but what the design of these kinds of systems exploits that breaks that style of system is that notice how in most of these examples, the letters are touching each other. And so if you have an image like this where most letters are touching each other, uh, or this one is even worse, um, and then you're, all you have is that input, now you have to guess what were the transformations that were applied in terms of rotation, scales, you know, warps, noise. Uh, it's very difficult to figure out where the gradient is to climb into, oh, it's getting more and more word-like, oh, I'm getting closer and closer to reading a letter here, um, because you don't know where the boundaries of the letters are, because they're touching each other. So you can't pre-segment the letters. All of the old attacks and captures involved pre-segmentation. Uh, and so in order to be able to solve these in a general way, um, you really need something, I mean, maybe there's some way to do it that I, I don't know about that you know, a smart person can figure out, but a lot of people have tried because it turns out there's a lot of money to be made in scamming banks and like stealing people's stuff. Um, and so you kind of need a system like ours. So this is something. What's more like the race of three, like reverse, like if you have a Photoshop picture, yeah. your question is like, well, what was the original image and what are the adjustments? Like? Right? Yeah. Try to reverse and that, which seems like maybe you can do it. I yeah. I think it's, uh, uh, yeah, I'd be curious if you want to give it a shot. Um, so we, uh, this is a, you can read the paper uh, um, online. This is something we published a couple of, maybe, I don't know, eight months ago or something, um, that goes into the details of the specifics of the kind of generative models that we focus on at Vicarious and the, the neuroscience uh, inspiration for them and, and how they relate to some of the other work. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much depth on that today. Um, we also tested on um, uh, reading street signs. Um, against the kind of old brain um, deep learning methods. So, um, and this is a, a, a case where by having stronger bias about what is a mammalian brain doing, we're able to build systems that outperform old brain systems and use a lot less training data. Uh, and for a, a pictorial representation on the left is like the Google uh, training data set, which is 8 million images. And on the right is the vicarious training set, which if you're having trouble seeing, uh, it's because it's in the dot of the eye. Um, <clears throat> And then what that lets us do is then we, when you're in a new environment and you see a bunch of random objects on a table, you can look at them once and then uh, in our system get 50 degrees of 3D rotation invariance and you can put those objects in industrial environments where robots need to manipulate them and the robots can then cope with those environments and changes in lighting and all kinds of things that are, are, are difficult for conventional AI systems. Um, we can also apply it to control. So this is the, the, the DeepMind um, re Deep Reinforcement Learning System uh, called uh, AC3 or A3C, Actor Critic. Um, and us, uh, we're our system on the left, that we have a paper in ICML that you can download and read about how this uh, works uh, exactly. It's a little bit too complex to explain in, in just this talk, but um, we can do things like if you make the image brighter, obviously we can keep right on playing. You can do things like um, move the paddle up. So this is analogous to a calibration error in a robot. As it turns out, robots, um, oftentimes will move their arm to an intended end effector state and um, they'll be off by a little bit. 
And so um, you need to be able to compensate for, for noise in your motors and joints. Um, whereas if you're, if you're working with a, a deep learning based system, it's gonna have a lot of trouble uh, generalizing to these kinds of variations. Um, or um, this one's sort of interesting. So um, this is what happens to DeepMind system at the end of the game. Uh, and because uh, when you go back and think of that, that giant uh, array of 50 million training frames it was trained on, very few of those frames are frames where there's just one brick left. Most of them are frames where there's lots of bricks left. And so now it's in a, it's in, in, in a, a state where it doesn't have a lot of training data anymore. And I, I, I bet you, or, you know, it's, there are probably only zero or one games where it happened to have just this brick left. And so uh, you see it's missing the ball a whole lot. And then when it does hit the ball, it doesn't hit it with any intentionality. Like it has no plan for how does it hit that last brick. If I let this video play, uh, we'd have to wait another 15 minutes before it cleared the board. Um, and because it's just responding in a stimulus response way, it's not being able to make these long-term plans, um, it's not able to aim to achieve a goal, which when you're in a body is a really important feature. Um, and when you have a model of causality and you can say, okay, this is the brick I want to hit, you can reason backwards to where your hand needs to be in order to hit the, hit the ball in the direction that's going to uh, enable you to clear the board. Um, it also enables you to cope with obstacles, like, yeah. Some would say that's a test coverage problem, that they didn't have enough, that a training set that covered all the end games. Yeah. They could have synthesized that. They could have. But I, I think the, the, then the further case comes in, in reality, you can't synthesize all the end games because there's an infinite number of positions that objects can be in. There's an infinite variety of objects that you may encounter or obstacles that may occur during the course of, you know, you're being in a body and needing to interact with the doors broken or loose or whatever. There's a million Not things you can have. Not for this case. But I think the, the aim of DeepMind is not to play Atari games. It's to build systems that start to capture more intelligent behaviors in the way you and I describe intelligence. Um, and so this is another one of those examples where how, how, how many different configurations of walls can you come up with? And eventually we explode the training state because it's, it's 50 million frames just to train the no wall version. And then you start adding walls in every different position. You start changing the size and shape of the board, the height of the paddle, and now we're in a combinatorial explosion. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's degrees of freedom. Yeah. And, and the, the problem in a constraint, if you reduce the degrees of freedom, but unfortunately the real world has lots of degrees of freedom. An unfortunate thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, and systems like ours, where you have a model of, of causality, um, you can then you know immediately say, oh, there's a wall there, so I just need to aim to the left in order to, to continue to get reward. How do you know it's a wall? Uh, so it's 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 by watching the game played, it watches what happens. So it's looking for causal relationships, uh, and it notices that when the ball or when this entity makes contact with entities that are gray, uh, it reverses direction. So it's a thing, it's, we don't give it any knowledge of physics at all, it's just learning causality relationships. And then uh, from that it learns schemas that it can then use to predict the future or reason backwards. Because of different, I mean, you're relying a lot on, on slavish pattern recognition rather than image filtering that says light things are walls, for example, or things with certain colors are walls. And not mapping this to grayscale so that... Oh, I mean, it doesn't, so it doesn't know it doesn't know that gray things are walls. It knows, it, all, all it knows is there's a whole bunch of entities in the world. And um, that's, the, the, that's the knowledge it starts with. Um, and we can even, there's another slide I, I had but I didn't include in this particular talk where we actually do change the colors randomly. But you say um, it doesn't know, but it yeah. could know. <laughs> yeah, it, it could know. I mean, that's something that we could come to. We didn't actually implement it's that. It's not a difficult transformation. Yeah, and that's something we could add later. And I think humans actually do, right? Well, you have a, you have a prior that says, oh, it looks, we call it an affordance, right? You have an affordance for, oh, it looks like a button. It's probably a button. Um, it looks like a wall. It's probably a wall. Um, this is another example where you get to that combinatorial explosion of, okay, what, what if we make the walls move um, and change their positions and velocities? Um, and this one really puts pressure on how well can you actually plan uh, because you have to, in order to get any points at all, you really have to know where everything's going and aim very explicitly. And to give you a, this is a visualization of what our system is actually doing. So the screen's going to turn white. While the screen is white, the game is paused, and it's just unrolling all possible futures. And so you can see it's, it's mo the learned dynamics that it's come up with by observing this game. And then it picks the, where it gets reward, which is right down the middle, and then it models again. So it doesn't move here at all because it doesn't need to. So, um, and we can also apply that same um, code base to 
you know, solving complicated puzzle games like this, where it's, it's not about reaction, it's about um, reasoning through a long, series, long causal chain in order to arrive at a destination where if you make missteps along the way, you can get into a, an unsolvable state. So to go back to the previous one, is, yeah. it, is it exhaustive? Does it have every possible, does it explore every possible? No. It's not, so uh, this is one, I can send you the paper if you like, that kind of goes into all the details about it. So it's, it's set up as a probabilistic graphical model and we do uh, belief propagation in it. Um, and anyway, um, let's get on to the, 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 so the robotics stuff. This is, um, so this year we've been uh, uh, putting all of these systems together inside actual robot bodies and having them do the kinds of tasks that children do and adults eventually do um, to get to this future where robots are increasingly common. When we talk about implications of like what happens, you know, in the next iteration of AI, the kinds of stuff that we're building at Vicarious and that other people are building elsewhere at other institutions, um, I think that you can get a pretty clear picture of where we're going with just one chart. This is the index price of labor versus the index price of a robot uh, since 1990. Um, and um, the robot side is actually, this chart was made a little bit um, prematurely because the robot side has dropped off precipitously in, in the last two years actually. Uh, and we've just reached the point where a small robot is less expensive than the annual salary of a Chinese factory worker. Uh, and so robots are getting very affordable. Um, we're in, this, in the middle of the sort of perfect storm of all these different technologies becoming available. Like your iPhone X comes with an RGBD camera in it that's very power efficient uh, and pretty accurate and, and fast. And um, that's another great uh, tool to have in your, in your toolbox when you're, when you're building something that needs to see the world and uh, have depth perception. Um, so, and this, I've already sort of answered this question, but if, if, like, if labor is getting incredibly expensive and robots are incredibly affordable, why doesn't everyone use them? Uh, not to pick fun of one of my investors, but <clears throat> traditional automation is very rigid. Like to program a robot to do something today, you give it a list of uh, points in 3D space that it's supposed to move its end effector through. And if you wanna tell me how to make a sandwich as a list of 3D coordinates to hold my hands in, it's gonna take a month for you to you know, convey to me how to do it. And then if someone like moves the bread a little bit to the left during the course of me making the sandwich, I'm gonna be putting peanut butter on the table. So it's a very, very brittle way of uh, accomplishing tasks. And it, especially if you wanna do something inside of a car like Elon is doing where you're, you're trying to uh, uh, harness wires through the inside of a, of, a, um, of a chassis. And those wires are bendable and so you need a, a closed loop percep perception and visual reasoning system in order to know where to move your hands. Um, and I think there's actually this really interesting parallel between robotics right now and, and computers in 1950. So in 1950, if you wanted a computer to do something for you, you basically needed a completely bespoke system that a engineering firm built for you that only did the one thing that you specced out in the RFP. Uh, and robots are the exact same situation today. If you want a robot to do something, you hire a custom engineering firm, uh, you write an RFP, you get bids, and they spend months uh, or a year building a system to do that for you. Uh, and I think robotics in the future is a lot like computers in the present day where they're just you know, cheap, ubiquitous, general purpose, uh, and we don't think about them anymore in the same way that we don't really think about computers anymore. Um, and I think of another lens I like on this is right now compute has reached the point where it's like electric, the, the price of electricity plus some epsilon. And I think uh, in the future, as these trends continue, we'll get to a world where labor is the price of electricity plus some epsilon, um, which has some implications that you might be wondering about with respect to labor, mar labor markets. Um, and if you ask the internet, like what's gonna happen in the world where these types of AI systems and robotic systems exist, uh, the internet will tell you that it's the end of the world and that we're all screwed and there aren't gonna be any jobs anymore. Um, and I actually think there's like a, a very underplayed counter narrative um, that uh, I think is worth talking about. So you, when you're on the internet, you may read uh, articles that say stuff like this, where you know, we're being afflicted with technological unemployment where people can't get jobs anymore. Anyone guess when this article was written? 1853. <laughs> 1853, well, maybe undershooting a little bit. This is 1930, yeah, 1930. Yeah, so um, this is not a new problem. Like the problem of having machines do stuff is not a new problem and I, I think um, one of the things that gives me comfort about the coming job apocalypse is if you look at the last 3,000 years of human history, it's, it's 3,000 years of people building contraptions that take a job that used to take five people a day to do and turn it into a job that takes one person a couple of hours to do. And that's everything from the printing press to the wheel to the telephone 
And after 3,000 years of doing that, we have more people and we have more jobs and we have a better standard of living than we've ever had. And so to me, the standard of proof required to believe that this time is different is very, very high. Um, and I think the best model we have, mapping we have, uh, is 1900s agricultural revolution, where you, we went from 40% uh, of the US working age population working on a farm to 2%. Uh, and uh, despite that enormous shift in where labor was deployed, it wasn't that we had 38% unemployment, it was you know, every decade since 1890, basically, the labor participation rate has gone up. And um, I think that you know, another great example is this, you look at ATM machines. When ATM machines were introduced, people thought it was gonna be the end of bank tellers. No bank was gonna employ bank tellers anymore and all of those people would be out of work. And in reality, we have more bank tellers now than we've ever had. Uh, what ATM machines did was they made the unprofitable parts of banking go away, taking deposits and giving out withdrawals, and then freed up the bank tellers to spend all their time selling very profitable things like home loans and credit cards and so on. Yeah. Uh, those, those, I mean, there are lots of other examples like telephone operators. That's a good example. Right. Yeah, that's true. So, so in some cases, technology disruptions do. Two million people. I mean, those jobs are gone. They're never coming back. So I wonder if I have the chart here. I do. Okay. So this is um, taxi drivers and ride sharing. So this would be another example. So I agree. In some cases, there is job destruction, and like no one operates a telephone anymore. But I would also argue that the result of that, no one goes back. No one today goes back and says, man, remember the apocalypse that came when all the telephone operators were unemployed? Remember how the world fell apart? No one says that because the world didn't fall apart, like everyone got new jobs and it was fine. Um, I live in Pennsylvania. There's large communities in New Jersey who are depressed because of the change in the communications system. Interesting. If you lived in, in, a, in, a, in an area where agriculture has been supported not by growing, but by the government paying you not to grow, mm -hmm. and then when government payments are withdrawn, yeah. see everybody end up working in uh, call centers. Yeah, I grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah, in farm country. So I, 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 I don't have um, a myopic view that it's going to be better for everyone, and and the future is full of magic unicorns. I think that there is going to be labor displacement, but the argument I'm making here is. That one that I don't hear from the headlines, which the, the headlines make the, make the case is that we're all screwed and it's going to be like an employment wasteland. And I think the what's closer to the truth is that there's going to be new, different kinds of jobs. Some things will be destructive, other things will be creative, and the effects aren't always predictable. And so, like this is a classic case in point where you're like, okay, the taxi industry is doomed because of ride sharing, and in reality, consumption of rides went up massively such that perhaps there is a decline in, in, in the taxi business, but it's nowhere near the scale that one might have predicted when you look at a world where anyone can summon a ride with their cell phone that isn't connected to the taxi services. Yeah? You can't say that for that graph. Uh, the, 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 the two things are on different scales. They're both scaled to being 100 in uh, um, early 2015, when perhaps the one for ride sharing should start to be starting from zero. Uh, it's indexed, right? So it's talking about growth and spend. So this is what this what this chart is showing is that the spend. So what you would expect, right? If you if the argument is true that people stop taking taxis, you would expect this line, the red line, to to go to zero, right? And instead, it stays at about a hundred, which means that the spend on taxis remains relatively constant in the face of this new product, where the spend goes up twelve hundred percent or twelve hundred points on this index scale, right? You've opened up, you, you've done a great job of opening up a, a, a whole series of Pandora's boxes. <laughs> so that it is true that for the technological revolutions that have happened yeah. up until about 10 or 15 years ago, we, it, it, it wasn't consistent that new jobs weren't created in the place the old jobs were eliminated, yeah. but there was, there was a net increase in jobs uh, to, to take over for the jobs that were lost yeah. as a result of the development of technology. Mm -hmm. You said it's unpredictable what the future is, and I think you're absolutely right. right. It is unpredictable. But it's unpredictable both ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, the, so the thing I'm arguing against is this. So the, um, the wall of headlines that say, it is the apocalypse, we are screwed. Well, there is a, there is a way that, that we can end up losing jobs and it not be the apocalypse. But, yeah. um, so you can take this out, but yeah. there, there's, 
We don't know which way it's going to go. I completely agree. We definitely don't know which way it's going. And that's exactly the point I'm trying to make. So I'm trying to make so that the point that I hear in the media, generally speaking, is we know which way it's going to go, and it's going to be the apocalypse. So that, that's what I see. And if, you'll see, too, if you just Google for like AI and jobs, is it's going to be the apocalypse. So I'm, I'm trying to introduce a counter narrative that says we don't know which way it's going to go. And here's another path down the road that we may end up on um, that you know, is, uh, is TBD. But here's some examples in the past where it has gone the other way. Yeah. The other counter narrative is these machines will be used for intelligence augmentation rather than labor replacement. Right. Yeah. And you know, maybe they'll keep us as their pets. <laughs> we make great pets. Yeah. There is, a, I think, an economic argument for, for how it's, why it's going to go in a particular way, and that's the sort of the, um, you know, how the kind of economic prosperity has been allocated over the last 40 years, and you've seen sort yeah. of greater growth in corporate profits mm -hmm. and lower growth in payment for labor to humans. Yeah. Right? And so, to me, what that says is that the, the sort of computing revolution is sort of ushered in this massive increase in productivity but it doesn't necessarily filter to in, down into down to humans it just gets skimmed off the top by companies. Yeah. And in general, if you run a company, you're like, well, of course, <laughs> you know, that's, that's what I'm going to do. So, so I mean, I, I think that's sort of the kind of an, an overall driving force towards this not so rosy future. Is that yeah. The way companies operate is that they're probably going to pay the robots less, you know, take any savings off the top, and you know. Through wages and humans will stagnate, and employment for humans is like stagnant as well. Yeah, let me just open a whole another uh, uh, Pandora's box here. So, uh, so I, I tend to think of this as a as a uh, uh, a mis misfire of the design of a, of corporate personhood or of, of a corporate entity. So I think right now corporations are legally required to maximize shareholder wealth, and um, I think this is not. No, in the state of Delaware, there at least at least no. So can you tell me more? Sure. Yeah. You 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 can say otherwise in your corporate bylaws and your rules. Okay. Make it make it public. Yeah. And trade your stock accordingly. You are not obligated to maximize profits. Are you talking about um, flexible purpose corporations and B corporations, or are you talking about regular C corps? Because there was case law in Delaware against Craigslist, actually, I believe that they were sued for not taking actions to maximize shareholder returns, and they lost. Um, so the, uh, the, the headway of, or the, the segue of this is that, California, sorry? In California, there's a special thing called a, a social purpose corporation, which, yeah. yeah. Just regular corporations. I, I mean, I think it's a citation needed thing. Can you point out the law that says corporations are required to do that? It's possible there is such a law in the books yeah. in Delaware. I mean, Delaware is full of credit card companies, <laughs> anti-social company and things that yeah. that. But you know, I mean, certain companies, even you know, well-known for-profit companies like Apple, say, look, you know, if you're in it just for the shareholder wealth, yeah, because it says, apply you know, elsewhere. Get out of stock. You know, what we do is we build computers. And most yeah. companies, if you look about what they do, they're they're founded for a purpose. Like FedEx delivers packages. Yeah. Apple builds iPhones. Like yeah. Only financial companies are defined are usually founded to like maximize the wealth of the shareholders. <laughs> so I, I I'll definitely get a citation on that. Yeah. Sorry? There's plenty of case law. In Is there a lawyer in the room? Has anyone ever said that? Before? There's plenty of case law in the US that, that, that says, in general, without a special purpose corporation with, with provisions to the contrary, that, that, that by default, the, that the corporation has a fiduciary responsibility to maximize you know, um, the shareholder wealth. It doesn't have to be in the short term. Yeah. Right? You plenty, you know, people used to joke that, that, that Amazon was a nonprofit corporation. <laughs> yeah, right? Amazon uh, right. But they fixed that. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> and their shareholders have done very well. Yeah, but but so they can certainly have a plan yeah. to um, to maximize that that value over the long term. Yeah. Right? And that doesn't necessarily mean making short sighted decisions. But but you're right that, that uh, at, uh, at at some level that's the purpose of a standard corporation. So I have a citation here. What is your name? <laughs> I'm just an informed guy like you. But okay. That doesn't sound like a citation to me. That uh, like I, I, there doesn't seem to be a particular law. But I was I was making yeah. a case. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is this is a thing that we can Google later. Well, well, wait a minute, guys. No. It doesn't matter. This is the judgment issue. Yeah. Would you like it? Would you like to continue making the point you were making before? Yeah. So the the point I was making, I really appreciate that. The point I was making is that I think that. Uh, your, 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 your point about how corporations, generally speaking, make decisions that are better for the shareholders and perhaps worse for society, 
Um, I view the purpose of corporations as things that exist for the betterment of society, not necessarily for the betterment of the shareholders, which are a subset of society. And like it ends when you have corporations that exist only for the betterment of sh shareholders, you end up with them making decisions to uh, externalize things like um, like pollution in streams or hiding the fact that cigarettes cause lung cancer. And so these are choices that are, uh, I think, there there are pressures to do from a shareholder perspective that are counter to what we would think of as being ethical. Uh, and I think this fits into that circle. And this is this is why I said, I'm opening another Pandora's box, which probably I should have not, known not to walk into. Uh, but yeah, there it is. Well, it's not that different from, again, um, degrees of freedom. So it doesn't really matter what the laws are mm -hmm. if we develop a system that it's going to force us in a particular direction. It's going to force us in that direction. The laws will change, and the behavior will change. The question is, what are the vectors that are going to force us to move? Yeah, yeah. And, and there's, a, great point. there's a countervailing vector in in Switzerland. A year ago, they had an election, mm -hmm. and uh, it was went to a general vote. The question was whether every citizen should be guaranteed an income. And it lost by 49 to 51 percent. Yeah. Um, so the other the other way around, um, capitalism is really good at resource allocation. Mm -hmm. And up until now, human labor has been scarce. But if it turns out that there's a lot of excess human labor, then one outcome is that everybody gets an income for being born, mm -hmm. and that you have to pay to do productive work. Yeah. So I think that's a really interesting possible future. And I also, I, the, the other side of it for me is, um, and this kind of goes into the next slide, this is the last one of the talk, um, is I, I don't, in my view, I don't think labor is going to be scarce. Like I think there's so much that humans can do to make our society better than it is right now. Like we don't live in Jetson's world uh, and we're very far from there because it's so expensive to build things. And there's, an, uh, there's a shortage, like uh, in my previous slide, 7 million unfilled welding positions in the United States alone. This is a random subset of jobs, but like there's a lot of unfilled jobs. And that 7 million unfilled welding positions without large-scale infrastructure projects to like fix parts of uh, our nation's infrastructure that are, are in decline without even building new stuff. And so I think there is a lot of opportunities for labor to be done. And there are areas where it's going to be really hard to have a robot that is general purpose enough to be able to do the motor actions required to navigate construction sites and perform those tasks. So I think there are lots of opportunities for labor. So yes, you may be right, but the other side would argue that um, if I can 3D print it, what does it matter? Yeah. So that's and that, so new technologies may emerge and all, you know, all kinds of interesting stuff can happen. So I, I guess the and this comes back to so what what does this mean? What opportunities might this create? What risks are there? We covered some of the risk. Um, in my view, there's so many different enabling technologies that come together in a world where not not only is prediction cheap in the big data internet sense of the word, but labor gets cheaper because the hardware and the software and the sensors and the ch the chips necessary to make labor cheap get more abundant. And so I, I think that that's the the final takeaway I would say is like what is where's a where is there a rising tide in this particular area? I would say the rising tide is around the different enabling technologies that come together to make autonomy uh, more affordable, more universal. Uh, and, uh, and to think critically about if you're looking at this from a, a business or a societal engineering per perspective, where are we using labor now? Where would we use labor if it were dramatically less expensive? Uh, and how would that change the way this aspect of business or aspect of society uh, tends to function? So that's all the thoughts I have for you today. Happy to take questions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you for the talk and all the answers. I have a, qu a question of <clears throat> with the, your basic premise of uh, reptilian brain, old brain, yeah. and mammalian brain. Mm -hmm. um, the fact is mammalian brain, a, a toddler, for example, to be able to open a, a door, the toddler has had to have been exposed to many, many millions of images. It's true. And that's common in old mammals, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, learning is essential for their survival. Absolutely. Whereas well, this is absolutely not true with insects, for example. Mm -hmm. A wasp that gets out of the cocoon, the minute it gets out of the cocoon, is able to hunt for prey, lay its egg, 
you know, yeah. sting the prey without no learning whatsoever. Yeah. So, um, and you see some of that too, like horses when they're born can immediately walk, which is something that takes humans years to, to be able to develop. Um, or maybe it depends on how the child comes along, but maybe six months. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a mix of learned behaviors and training data is a really important part of it. it. From the calculations I've done anyway, if you make some reasonable assumptions about, you know, the, the, the kid is colorblind and happens to only have monocular vision and it's got some uh, deficiencies, so the vision's a little blurry. So if you make some assumptions like that uh, and uh, calculate the amount of training data that a three-year-old gets during that period, it's in the order of terabytes or maybe tens of terabytes. So it's not an unfathomably large amount of training data for today's computers to consume. It's very difficult to make these things because there's a process, a biological process called myelination that has to happen. Mm -hmm. The nervous system of a newborn human child does not work. Right. It, until it's been, the nerves are coated with fat, it's called myelination, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter how many times you've been exposed to whatever picture or drawer or whatever, it, that part of your nervous system is not functioning to be able to capture that information, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And until that happens, and when that happens, typically with, with human children, it doesn't take very many repetitions, and maybe none at all. So it, it's very complicated to try to do it that way. Yeah, I guess the calculations from, from my perspective is even assuming that we, 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 we've had myelination happen at birth, even assuming that, it's only on the order of terabytes or tens of terabytes of data, which is not a ton of data you know, to run through uh, you know, a supercomputer. Right, so, but a horse is, that's the difference. The horse, when it's born, yeah. it, the, the nerves that control its ability to, to walk are, have already been myelinated. Yeah. But then I'd like to take it from another angle. Yeah. You, know, you, you talk about the cortex. So let's talk about birds, mm -hmm. parrots, for example, yeah. or cephalopods. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, cephalopods. You have yeah, yeah. animals there that are yeah. able to generalize, that are able to solve a problem to yeah. count up to 10 mm -hmm. and are markedly smarter, although it could yeah. be arguable, than other mammals. So I should, I should have actually included a, a section on birds. This is sometimes people bring this up, sometimes they don't. But birds um, have a, cor a very, very cortex. They basically have an analogous cortex-like structure uh, in their brains that does the same functions as our cortex, and it's a very similar structure. So I would say that, that the computations that the birds are doing, the computations we're doing are, if they're not the same computation, they're very, very close. The, the cephalopod case, I have no idea how an octopus works. Octopuses, I think, are fascinating. I wish I knew. <laughs> And then I would talk about fish, you know, sharks, yeah. right? Until very recently, they were really assumed to be incapable of smart and social behavior. Mm -hmm. I think a lot has to do with our inability to observe and have noticed intelligent behavior in the lower animals. Mm -hmm. And so I would be careful to draw conclusions on the, you know, uh, role of the cortex into making a machine able to, you know, solve problems, generalize, and because fish, for example, uh, you know, my experience has shown, you know, amazing, uh, has shown that actually we don't know, we don't know very much, and it might be just that we just don't know that. Interesting. We haven't observed the intelligence because we're not able to actually, perhaps we don't even know what to look for yeah. to detect it. So. I would love. So I would love uh, if you could maybe give me some some more concrete after the talk, give me some more concrete examples of this stuff because I, it's it's, I think it's really incredibly fascinating. And I, it's something I want to know more about because I think there's some lessons we could draw from there too. The examples that I have in, in my talk, and there's some, there are lots of others we can come up with, but it's basically trying to show that intelligent looking behaviors are actually simple heuristics behind the scenes. And um, I agree, it's incredibly difficult unless you do the kinds of experiments that, that are the ones that I talked about where you like have the iPhone in front of the frog or you have the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the tape recorder inside of the wolf taxidermy, uh, it's hard to reveal is the animal smart or is it just following a simple pattern? Uh, and it's a really interesting area of research and one that I wish I knew, I wish I had even more examples from. So let's talk about that after this, yeah. Even, even with humans, it's, it's sort of well known that people often make these gut decisions and then you ask them later and they come up with some sort of like post hoc <laughs> rationalization. Yeah. Thing. But it, it was not at all the reason they actually did it. They yeah. did it because it, oh, it, it looked good or, or it sounded good or you know, some sort of thing that they can't really articulate. Yeah. I mean, we, there's, 
that I would say that's a whole separate thing. I, the, the behaviors that I think are most interesting for this era or this coming era of AI, like I, you, you're hitting at sort of the era after this one. The era I'm talking about is the ones where like the robots can like make a sandwich in a kitchen, you know, and it's an arbitrary kitchen, and so they like know you know how to take the forks out and like move the peanut butter around and stuff, and that's those are tasks where you don't need a justification, you don't need uh, conceptual knowledge and the kinds of explanations people give that are sort of ego defending and like it's you know there's a whole layer of nuance there that is even far beyond the kinds of stuff that I'm talking about uh, but I mean hopefully someday the machines will give us long-winded explanations of why they did something I'm still hung up on a slide about five slides back showing the uh, normalized expenditure on taxis versus rideshare services okay can you back up yeah five slides what that's trying to say and what it is saying, but it certainly looks deceptive to me. Okay. <laughs> well, let's see if we can figure it out together. Um, the thing that I'm hopeful that it says, and maybe it doesn't say this, but the thing I'm hopeful it says is that um, after the introduction of Uber, um, spend on taxis um, wasn't significantly affected. Okay, but... Um, but as John Nagel said, the fact that that's normalized to uh, 7, 2015 yeah. means nothing. What if you would normalize that with 100 as of mid-2016 or as January 2017? You would have had a long zero that then started rising. I mean, do you have so a sense if I, what even if I, if I normalized it here, her, you know. What, 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 is, what, what would you guess is the actual dollar expenditure? Yeah, they were both in dollars. Yeah, I wish they were both in dollars. I mean, that's something I have to dig into. But it, I, I guess that the question I'm asking is, does it matter? So, like, if we normalize here well, or like here, the total expenditure now is only one tenth of what's going into the taxis, and it's irrelevant. Well, but that, and that's what this I thought that's what this chart is showing is it not so like this is saying that it's about you know here's a hundred and it's still about a hundred at both sides. So does it matter where we started the normalization? Like, if there was a, t a tenfold decline in, in spend on taxis, this black line would be heading towards the. The bottom, I'm saying right? the dollar spent on the green line is still less than the dollar spent on the taxi line. Well, then the, then the, the uh, incursion of the ride share service wouldn't be significant enough to have caused much of a change. Certainly not, not in the way that it's shown here anyway. Yeah. So, you, so you want to say? But the, the question that I would ask about this slide okay. is, is the time scale shows it appropriately. So yeah. we... we we have a data point from this distasteful lawyer, Cohen, uh, Trump's um, mm -hmm. <laughs> fixer. Yeah. Uh, apparently, he invested in taxi shields in New York City. Mm -hmm. And whether you like him or not, <laughs> his, his taxi shields have fallen tremendously in value. Yeah. Uh, so. Which would suggest that this is wrong in some way or, you know, it's not representative. It, it, it suggests that. The future value of the of the taxi shields, the future value of the taxi uh, uh, business Enterprise. In, in New York City has fallen based on what people expect. Yeah, uh, they also could be wrong. Yeah, right. But based on five suicides of taxi <laughs> drivers and owners in New York City, okay, alone, yeah. So they're probably right. right. So this is yeah. New yeah. South Wales. NSW is new sex. Is, is five Maybe more or less than the average? Like, how does this compare to the dentist suicides in New York City? Okay. But this is New South Wales, correct? Yeah. Australia. NSW, yeah. New South Wales. Okay. Is it? Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. So yeah. New South yeah. Wales is a very particular environment. Mm -hmm. It has a very low population density, um, and it has a particular um, employment pattern yeah. and a particular economic base, which is radically different from New York City. I mean, you could not find two different, two more dissimilar places. New South Wales is Sydney, right? No, Melbourne. Sydney, oh, Sydney. Sydney. Yes, Sydney. Sydney. No, is right. Sydney. Melbourne. No, no Sydney no, is right. Sydney. Yeah. No, New South Wales is a state in which Melbourne is. Sydney is in a different state. No, Sydney is in other stuff. Okay. Well, well, so I think what I'm hearing is I should probably take this slide out of my talk. It's not, so this slide is not particularly important to the points I'm trying to make overall. We'll take the microphone from oh, yeah. you because then you can tell the truth because those <laughs> hanging from the top are spiders. Yeah.